Hi there. Welcome back, finally, to a new episode of Tinnitus TV. Today, I am talking to the one and only Reckless Eric. These days, he's right back where he started. Sort of. More than 45 years after promising to circle the whole wide world in his breakthrough hit, the idiosyncratic singer-songwriter has gone back home on his latest album, Leisureland. Loosely inspired by his upbringing in a British seaside tourist town, the LP is set in the mythical burg of Standing Water, home to the majestic theater, the Esplanade, countless bad hats, and the local band of John, Paul, George, and Alan. If it all sounds a bit eccentric, well, it is, much like the man himself. Join us as Eric and I chat about the proper pronunciation of leisure, the joys of home studios, his harrowing bout with COVID, his equally talented wife, Amy Rigby, and much more. Enjoy. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Am I, uh, am I about on time? <laughs> You're right on time, sir. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's lovely to meet you. Wow, it is. It's one minute past three. I've managed that. I, for, I forgot one of these things the other day and got in trouble. Oh, well, OK. I'm glad. I don't, I don't want you to get in trouble. That's a lovely oh. uh, home studio you've got there behind you. Well, it's my studio. Yes, it's uh, where I I mean, I don't know. It's funny, you know, I, I don't really care anymore. But there was a time when I would have half murdered you over the Internet for saying home studio, because I, I did it before anyone did it. You know, I mean, I started making homemade records in like 1980 four or something or 85 and uh i never stopped but people people were kind of uh they sneered at it you know and it was oh, no of, yeah no sneering no, involved like it. <laughs> i mean in those days it was very uncool to do that you know it was like people said oh the trouble is you don't know what you're doing you know <laughs> Well, you, it seems but to have worked true, out well for you. Know, you. But, but I would say, well, I, you know, if I, if I knew what I was doing, I'd know what was going to happen. And if I knew what was going to happen, it, it would be really pointless because, like, it's an adventure, you know. That's true. That's true. The mystery is, is half the fun. Yeah, so, but, like, over the years, I got better at it. And, like, you know, and there was a point where I didn't really want people to know I was ashamed almost not ashamed but I didn't want to sort of like open the dialogue if you like you know about my homemade records you know well, yeah I mean it, uh, again it, it whatever you're doing it's working for you I mean especially on the new one that we're here to talk about which is I mean I think North Americans will say leisure land but it's probably leisure land leisure land yes it's English so you know like you're going to have to get used to it exactly, exactly. or you can say it wrong I really don't mind actually I didn't think about the pronunciation you know, well, you're gonna you're gonna have to get used to a leisure land all on this side. I of should the have I, I should have had a marketing department, but uh, <laughs> when I made the record, I didn't have Tapeta or Tapeta or I don't know how to pronounce my record label. I don't know how you pronounce. <laughs> it. I think it's it's German and it means carpet. Sure, we'll say that. <laughs> or fitted carpet or something like that. I'm not uh -huh. sure. But um, close carpeting, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I didn't have them. So, like, I didn't really have a marketing department. I didn't have anyone who could say, uh, you know, we, we need to talk about this because uh, North, we're going to have to call it something else in North America because they can't say leisure land. You'll teach them. You'll teach them. So, so if I under if I understand the the press notes uh, that you sent over correctly, this album, in a way, uh, was kind of sparked by your horrific uh, COVID experience. Well, 
I don't know why it was sparked by, really. It's funny, you know, and the, it, it, when you look at these things in retrospect, you can go, oh, yeah, it was obviously that happened because that happened and that happened. But, I mean, the fact is that, like, I mean, it was a really strange time, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I think I did one of the last shows ever in North America. <laughs> I, 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 I played on a Saturday night in Cambridge, New York, which is out in the middle of nowhere. And this fantastic place and like, it was only half the people that were going to come were there, which was probably just as well, you know, because a lot of people had sort of got the idea that things might be a bit weird with this, um, this virus that they were talking about. And, uh, it got to mon- Monday, like, I started to feel a bit weird, actually, when I was there at this place. I started to feel a bit weird. And then on Monday, I felt very ill, and that coincided with the first day of the lockdown. And I felt really awful. I couldn't get off the floor, you know. Yeah. But like, I was like that for a couple of weeks and I thought, oh, I better not go out anywhere, you know, so I was just staying in the house. And and, um, and my wife, Amy, she wasn't well, but she wasn't as bad as me. And then we were better, we felt, uh, but I didn't really feel right, but I was okay. But I'd asked if I'd got COVID and they said I hadn't because my symptoms didn't match up with the perceived symptoms of this new thing so and then I started to feel I carried on feeling unwell and then and then I felt really quite unwell and then I got tested they started testing and it's it was all over a period of like a couple of months or something I don't know and I got tested and I had it and I'm going, I told you, because they <laughs> changed all the symptoms, you know. Yeah. Yes, I was like, uh, no, I wasn't. I wasn't like Donald Trump and the medical people where he said, I got a real feel for this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, one of the great comedy moments of the pandemic. But the, but then but then I mean um, you know comedy. But is then I, sort of, yeah, I, you know? I got a bit more ill, and then I sort of like I had this heart attack because my breathing had got really messed up. My lungs were all messed up, and uh, I was um, hmm, yeah, I sort of nearly kicked the bucket in the emergency room. Wow. Which was terribly exciting, you know, because nothing had happened for weeks. It was like, but it was so weird, like suddenly from going from, you know, going off here and there and driving cars at high speed and unloading equipment and playing and all this to sort of sitting there going, huh? <laughs> you know, what do we do now? <laughs> So I was, I just, the only time I ever felt right was when I was in the studio. I like it in here. This is my, you know. So, so, I mean, I guess it's cliche to say, but you know, you, you have this uh, near death experience and, and they say your life is supposed to flash before your eyes. And, and this is what flashed before your eyes. No, no, nothing (laughs) flashed. Before my eyes I don't think it did I can't remember any flashes before my eyes I was just I kept plugging stuff into me and <laughs> what what's that you know what's that machine do and they sort of shut up you're supposed to be dying you know? <laughs> it's a like that it was a bit more like that uh yeah when I was out of that I was just I think that you get a bit reflective I think I did afterwards and um you know, I, I I don't know. I tried to explain this to someone the other day. Who said, so then you made an album about it all, and I'm going, well, not really. Not it's really, like no. saying, like, you know, when you go, when you like demolish a wall. Imagine you were demolishing a stud wall in a house. You you don't demolish the wall. You make a hole in it, and then you make 
make a bigger hole and then you start the pull pits. And making a record is a bit like that, really. It's it's not. Um, I, I think it's a, a, well the way I work because I don't have to go into a studio and book time and like you know pay somebody. I just do it, and. I work on, I work with stuff when I'm not doing something specific, like working on a record for me or someone else. I'm, I, I make sort of strange, like not even demos, just recordings of, like I get a piece of equipment out and mess around with it and sort of like make some sort of recording and I collect all of these and when I'm looking for something a bit more specific I might look through them and I might start to develop one of those kind of pieces or put it together with something or you know there's a million different ways that it can happen really. So it's like an audio sketchbook in a way. Yeah, and uh, yeah, in a way, it's like that. I was like that. Sketchbooks are a good idea, but I misunderstood it for a long time. I thought that that you know was a very correct practice because I was an artist. Mm. I was a visual artist, you know, mm. uh, and I went to British art schools where they they give you a hard time, and. Uh, so I thought it was this sort of very lofty discipline, keeping a sketchbook. But I mean, it isn't really. It's when, when it's music, it's called playing. And I, I like this idea because it is. It's just messing around with stuff. And like there comes a point where you have to sort of do something a bit more than just messing around. You have to sort of take something and run with it right well and, and you certainly did in this case i mean is it is it okay to call this a concept album because it feels I, like a concept I, album I, I thought i thought at one point it was going to be but it it's not really i mean like if you look at a record like ziggy stardust you've got all this idea on the beginning of it it's like oh five years now oh, it's the end of the world Right. And then you've got this other story going on, which is like, which is really side two of the record, mostly, where you've got Ziggy Stardust going from superstardom to suicide, right? You know, and then there's all this other stuff that could or couldn't have something to do with it. And I thought, well, he did that. That that was all right. So can I can I do that? Because I don't like the idea of sticking slavishly to a concept when you're not even sure what the concept is. But I think because I was not going anywhere, it's almost like I invented a place. Right. And I had this idea, uh, the, like the, a town called Standing Water, and that came from the idea of this stagnant boating lake. There's a town that I spend a lot of time in in England uh, called Cromer, and it's a seaside town, and it's a little bit run down. They all are, really. Seaside towns are, are weird. You know, some people own an amusement arcades and... Right and stuff like that and they make a lot of money and everyone else sort of like doesn't and there's a lot of unemployment because they don't have factories at seaside towns generally right tourism so, is the yeah yeah so and that's seasonal so everyone's kicking around at a loose end during the winter and uh so i kind of invented this place that was based on a lot of other places and I like this idea, and it gave me somewhere to go. <laughs> when, I could, when I couldn't go anywhere, I could go to this place. Yeah. But uh, I also like, I mean, there are songs that have got mm, li less to do with that. Um, there's, uh, oh, God, I forget the name of my own songs. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> Well, Southern uh, Rock to me, uh, the, the, the song that opens it, <clears throat> it, 
it seems uh, a little bit of an outlier, but it, it, it fits well, in. Well, not really, in a way, because it kind of sets the idea up. It is, yeah, because I wasn't thinking about that. I mean, it was just me being like, you know, a kid, a teenager and stuff. And like, you know, and, and, and I, I had that written in a notebook. It was just the line, listening to Southern Rock in Southeast England in 1971. I thought, that's great. That, that that's that's it's just so ridiculous you know yeah. we're all trying to figure it out and no, no one in england at that time had any clue where anywhere in america was and i love that idea once i was in a class at school and the teacher was uh, making people come out he had a big map of the world and you had to put a pin in the uh in like he gave, gave you a, a, a city and told you to put a pin in the map where the city was, you know. So, like, I mean, I was about 11 at the time, and I'd come out <laughs> like that, you know. And he gave me New York. And so I came out, and obviously, I mean, everyone in England knew New York is the capital of the United States. <laughs> so if it's the capital, it's going to be in the middle. So I put a pin where Kansas was. <laughs> yeah, and they laughed at me. <laughs> but I loved it. These these kind of mythical places. I'm thinking, who are these California girls? Because the Beach Boys wish they could all could be California girls. And um, I mean, that was something. When I first met California girls, it was still like you know the the seventies. And they really did have this kind of, they had makeup that we couldn't believe, uh, like parrot plumage kind of colours, you know, yeah. um, like just never seen anything like that. They were just from a different planet. They were a different species. <laughs> they were like goddesses, you know, uh -huh. and... Uh, yeah, fairly neurotic goddesses, but oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but that yeah that that was later, of course. But I mean, like to start, I had no idea where California was. I didn't know. I know mean, some long distance information get me Memphis, Tennessee, and like you know, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis comes from Memphis, you know, and they've got the Memphis horns and. And is is that Muscle Shoals? Is that I wonder wonder where all the you know, but I don't know. These places all existed, but I mean they were all so kind of far. It was pointless to find out where they were because you were never gonna go there. Huh? But you could dream of these wonderful places. Have you ever been to Memphis? In fact, I have been to Memphis and I'm going back again in the fall. Yes. It's Great place. I've been to Memphis loads of times, but I mean, you know, you think about what you thought about it, and if you'd known what, what, because, you know, in a way, it's a bit of a dump. I mean, sure. it's, a, it's great, you know, but I, mean, I don't think anyone would, would disagree with me there, really. Yeah. You know. Well, you know, talking about that, I mean, listening to, to Leisureland, uh, I don't get the sense. You know, I have a hard time c c trying to uh, decide whether you're you're definitely not being nostalgic or romantic no. about the place, but it's not really like, um, you know, the, that you're being too critical of it either. It, it's almost uh, the whole album to me almost feels like kind of a dream, kind of a yeah. snapshots or a fever yeah, dream, as it were. Because it's not a real place and I don't want it to be a real place, you know, and I love that there's a band and they're, they're, they don't have a name. They're just John, Paul, George and Alan. Alan, and yes. They could, be, they could be bigger than the Beatles, but... Except for Alan. <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I need to fix that, you know. Yeah, but... <laughs> um. Yeah, in the video, there's a video of the song Standing Water, and I made this video, and there was like the the three of them were sitting on a wall, and like Alan 
is sitting slightly apart, but then I felt terribly sorry for Alan. So in one of the bits where they come in, I moved him up and they were together, you know. <laughs> kind of reminds another... me of the rattles a bit, you know. And then there's another, yes. And there's another one where, where Paul is sitting facing backwards. <laughs> I've decided to subscribe to the Paul is dead theory, you know, conspiracy theory. Why not? Well, I think it's, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> fuck it, I'm going to have some fun. Exactly. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, the, I mean, the other thing sonically with this, it kind of, again, um, leans into that dreamlike quality. Uh, the, the vocals, at least on the, on the version I heard, which I'm not sure is the you know the finished master or whatever, but the vocals seem a little bit uh, a little bit buried in the mix, not quite yeah. on the top oh, of the songs. Yeah, yeah. sometimes, yeah, and, um, and a lot of reverb, a reverb. The songs kind of flow into each other. It's a very immersive record. It really yeah, pulls yeah. you in, yes. you know. It's, um, it's kind of like some of it's quite crappy, you know. It's quite scrappy sounding, and then other bits really work. You know, and I thought that was a bit like painting, really. You don't yeah. want the whole painting to go at the same speed, all, all nicely worked out. There's bits that have got to be a bit forgotten over there, you know. And um, yeah, but it, it seems like, uh, I mean, does it was this um a tremendous amount uh, uh more work than than sometimes goes into your uh, okay. album because when you're just writing a song and then another song and then another song that's one thing uh, but this feels like a whole elongated piece of work you know i think my last three albums have all been kind of joined up like that in a way um yeah the construction time and demolition was quite joined up but i mixed that in someone else's studio um and i mixed the one after that was called transience and i mixed that at the same place down in nashville uh but this one i did it all here myself mm. and uh, i i kind of had this idea that it would be like some sort of weird you know like a soundscape or a dreamscape or something right. mm. and and uh there's quite sudden cuts in the songs. They don't have clever sort of like, you know, riffy kind of devices that take you from one bit to another. They just stop and like you hear something weird and it starts into the next bit. Yeah. But it's still the same song, you know. And, yeah, yeah. No, it works but, well. And for uh, a guy in such a way with words, uh, you have a lot of instrumentals on this album. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I I have this thing about words that, you know, having good words doesn't have to mean that there are a lot of them. So I've always cut them down and cut them down. And like, uh, I cut out, I, I do a lot of editing. I do a lot of like audio editing and I also edit songs down and people give me songs that are four minutes long and I, I give them back and they're a minute and 20 you know and I go right you don't need that but you don't need that the second verse is not saying anything new so let's cut that out and go straight into the chorus and then we'll we'll yeah we can have a bit of a bridge we'll have a bit more chorus and then we're out wow. and they're going but, but what about my, you know, I don't know yeah. that, you know, it's, it's sure. boring. It's, it's like, we want to get there quickly. Sometimes I, 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 I don't hold with the don't bore us, get to the chorus. Right. I think that might have been Tom Petty that said that, but I know what he meant, but sometimes I think, it doesn't matter if it never gets to the chorus as long as it's interesting. Right, exactly. If, if anything that stops being interesting, try and cut it out. You know, you don't, you know, like, I've, I've, I've sort of said, the trouble is I haven't got a second verse. Uh, well, it's probably a good reason. The universe is probably telling me that I don't need a second verse. And there were also... There were songs. So like sometimes like the the 
so much gets cut out that there is hardly any vocal left to do. Then you've got an instrumental. And there was one that was called The Tipping Point. Yes. And that, that was a song, definitely. And some of it got left in. But it was a crummy song, so like, but the track sounded great. I thought, oh, just leave all that out, you know. And then suddenly, some of it went through a rotary cabinet. I have a rotary cabinet in the other room. It's completely homemade. You now it's always mic'd up, and I stick stuff through it. And oh, so I've got some stuff going through the rotary cabinet, and half the vocal came back. And I sort of like it sounded good, so I left that in. But it's completely unintelligible. And well, I like that. I like. I like. You know. I like. I like if you've got some words and you can't hear them. That's sometimes more interesting than really being able to hear what it is. Well, it's I was going to ask, are you planning to put a lyric sheet in with this or are you just going to leave people to their own devices? No, I'm, uh, I'm working on a little book that's called <laughs> The Leisure Land Companion. <laughs> wow. And I thought, I thought it sounds like, you know, you buy it in a Goodwill or something, you know, one uh -huh. of those you know, sort of like something that someone's given someone for their birthday or something because they couldn't think what else to give them. And it's ended up in the charity shop. <laughs> and this will be what, like the stories, uh, some sort of story? Yeah, yeah, but stuff in, about the record and like, you know, and like photographs and documents and crummy bits of notes and photographs of equipment and unlike stuff I've written about the songs like sometimes like what they're about or how I might have recorded it or how it came about or something just stuff I thought that was more interesting because when I finished it I was going to put it out on it we have a little record label called Southern Domestic and we put stuff out on it but um I was just gonna do it I wasn't even going to do vinyl because like it's so hard to do it it's so hard to sell it it's like when you're not set up for it it delays the release by months and months and then you go on tour and like that's your big moment to sell all the vinyl and the vinyl comes two days before the end of the tour because yeah. it was held up in the pressing plant and so on and like so I was just going to put it out on CD and I thought well I don't want to have all the stuff on the CD the lyrics and people are going what is this and they can't <laughs> read it you know so i thought i'll put it all in a book and i'll sell that alongside it for anyone who wants it because i mean like you know do you ever read what's on the inside of a cd or take one of those silly books out of the jewel case yeah the magnifying glass basically at, at, at my age anyway no, anyone's age, yeah. you know. I mean, I don't know anyone who's ever read the inside of a CD. Yeah. Well, I probably do. I probably have. Uh -huh. But um, so, like, so I had no idea. So I, I was looking around for a publicist and uh, I spoke to the distributor that I, I've got a distributor that I work with and uh, they told me about this guy, so I call, I called him and got in touch with him, and he said, look, I'd really like to work with you. Send me the record, and I'll see what I can do. So I sent him the record. He got back to me, like, hours later. He said, I, I want to do this. I want to do this. Now, look, say no if you feel uncomfortable with this, but would you mind if I pitched it to a record label that I work with? And I'm going, wait can if you like but I mean I wasn't you know and the next thing I've got to Petter records is like you know they're on it and, and I'm going they must be they've got me mixed up with someone else or something <laughs> but uh it's been great but it was it was not how I'd originally conceived the whole thing well I'm glad it's working out well it certainly deserves it the album is 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 really fantastic um talking about going back out on tour though uh 
given you know the COVID experience, are you yeah, yeah. excited, nervous? Are you masking? How's that going to work for you? Um, no, I'm not wearing a mask or anything like that. Not these days. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I'm not scared of the world, you know. I mean, like, I think we're going to be okay. I mean, I went out uh, the year after the pandemic while it was still really going on, but when things started to open up, in 2021 was it 2021 i can't remember the years now yeah, 2022 but, maybe early 2022 i think or but, 2020 no 2020 i can't what year did it start was it 2020 20? you had it you had it probably in march 2020 yeah and then i think september 2020 i actually went out on tour wow. okay so you were you been out. have you had any lingering i mean uh, you know Oh yeah, yeah. I've got. I've, I think I've got long COVID. And how does I, that impact your you as a as a singer? And a, I mean, are you able to? You know, do you have the breath? Do you have the memory? Is, is yeah, everything's working? Oh, yeah, my memory's fine. Um, my my there's the singing is kind of like I have to. Um, I have to go to the gym quite a lot. Um, basically, do do stuff that makes me breathe mm. um and the more i breathe the better it is right um i get very tired sometimes it goes in waves but i did go out on tour and before and it was fine but i mean i had to sort of i, I would be driving along to somewhere and i'd have to pull over and sleep in the back seat <laughs> <laughs> we all do that sometimes um so, oh, so more more than ever you know right um, um i used to do so many shows i, I can't do that many anymore mm. i also think the pandemic made me think wait a minute if you're not doing all those shows you've got all this other time that you can devote to doing other stuff which is just as valid and like here i am i still exist um, where you know like for a lot of artists it's like well the records get through to so few people these days compared with what it used to be like it's right. like without doing all this other stuff like going on tour maybe you don't exist mm. so it's a way of making sure that you still exist but i thought yeah I'm doing a lot less, but I still exist and I'm still doing stuff and it frees up time. So I think carefully about what I will and won't do now. So is it is it fair to say that we probably won't wait uh, four years for another studio album? No, I mean, that was... Yeah, I mean, like I did... Uh, like I was starting to do one a year <laughs> but, but almost you know uh, let's get back to that we, we would uh, yeah, there are a lot of people I, who I would that. love to I would really love to get back to that I mean this year I've done I finished my album and then I've worked on an album with a man called Ross Goldstein who is a very obscure kind of person like uh musician but he's incredible um uh quite difficult to work with in a way his mind is racing and he's going okay can we do that and you go sure yeah and you're setting that up and he's going right well, what we need to do is this and like you're going okay, okay i'll just uh um uh, you know he's he's like that so but is he I, a singer or, or a guitar player what, what does he do he plays, he plays everything oh. and he says you know he picks up a bass says like yeah i got i put a bass on this now and uh, i'll have to just figure it out and i just scramble take it because it will be great and it's him figuring it out you know and everything <laughs> it's like you, you just look at him in awe he looks like he looks like some guy that 
runs an obscure wireless component shop or something, you know. He doesn't even look like a musician. And he sits there at the piano and like, plays keyboards and plays all this stuff and has this way of figuring out that he's going to put this together like this with this and like you're just like, I'm in awe of him. Oh, great. But I, I, I did an album with him, which will come out and probably most people will never hear it, which is a shame, but it's how it is. And I'm working on one with Amy. Oh, wow. Oh, great. Yes. You know all about Amy. Already. Of course. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so we're trying to get her album finished before I have to go and get before my album comes out. We're trying to get hers finished and uh, ready to go out somewhere. Well, that's yeah. great. I mean, an, an album from uh, each of you in the next year so, is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'm I'm on my third album of the year. Oh, excellent! Well, great. I mean, yeah, my I mean, my so, one took a long, a lot longer, really. Sure. Yeah. For several reasons, obviously. Um, what what is your relationship? <clears throat> like right now with with your older songs because i mean obviously you've got a couple of songs that you just have to play at every show but for some performers that can be kind of a handcuffy situation you know they they go up and down on them it's look the first thing is that like when you're a kid you know like, or for me it's like i would i was thinking wouldn't it be great if you had a hit record? And then I did. And then I, I, then I had this idea, I'm thinking, wow, wouldn't it be great if you'd written something like Gloria and every, by them, you know, and every band that ever got together in a garage would go, well, yeah, we didn't know any songs, but we did know Gloria. Well, you know, and that, like, every band does it at some point or 96 tears or something like that and i'm thinking i've done it i've actually done it i mean everybody does whole wide world at some point yeah they all do i mean like some people play it really badly and i'm sure other people do it better than i do but they do it so if I go, oh, that, you know, I'd be a bit miserable, really. Yes. So I, I have to have some pride in it. But it, it is difficult sometimes because I, I don't know how to fit it in. You know, like it's like if I was doing a reading, uh, if I was an author and I'm doing a reading from my new book and uh, I've got another book that I wrote, you know, 40 years ago that's really successful and had to, in the middle of the reading, slip in a bit from that book. It's right. a bit like that sometimes. It's like, but I will try because it's it's... It's something that other people don't have. You could say that I come with baggage. And I thought it'd be great to be just somebody like unknown and you come along and you could be as weird as you like and you could, you know, but that's hard. I mean, for people who haven't got, I've got this God-given gift of a hit, you know. Yeah. So, so I'm, uh, I... I have to make space for it. Exactly. I mean, you could say that my my baggage is designer luggage, so it's not so bad, really. No, I'm talking about about when to play it. I, I years ago I talked to Jackson Brown, and he said that when he gets on stage, as soon as somebody yells "Running on Empty," he plays it. Really? It doesn't matter if it's the first song or the second song or the last song. As soon as he hears, because inevitably somebody does, right? You know, I'm sure you walk on stage and they start yelling for it, yelling for a whole wide world. So he just yeah. plays it whenever he hears it and then it's I done. Then dare. it's all over I, with. I don't dare. <laughs> <laughs> I scare them. No, um, no. Um, no, people are very nice. I mean, they want to hear it, but you know they want to hear other stuff which is good but uh it's better yeah 
Yeah. Um, you know about Neil Young? Apparently there was some show where someone was shouting for his hits and that. And uh, he, he eventually, like, he's doing a solo show and it was all, you know, and he's doing stuff and, like, everyone's into it. But this guy is shouting... Uh, shouting all these suggestions for what he's supposed to play next. And he suddenly went, hey, come up here, come <laughs> up here. And invited him on stage. And when he got him on stage, he said, you know, I'm very rich. I don't have to do this, but I like doing it, you know. But as I say, I'm very rich. So how much did it cost you to get in tonight? And he got his wallet out and gave the guy some money and said, <laughs> well there you go <laughs> and, have this, and, and i thought wow <laughs> um, i don't think any less of him for that i think the more of him i think he's hilarious you know he's a very funny man i think yes well uh, you could you could try that next time i'm not going to do that <laughs> <laughs> all right sir. yeah i you know what it's like i just i don't want to be sold as a security as a as a security risk as a nostalgia <laughs> It's my long COVID. No, <laughs> as, a, as a as a nostalgia act, same no. idea, really. Um, but uh, yes. No, I think you've avoided the nostalgia act tag by putting out uh, twenty albums. You know, there's a lot of people would would have who would have been happy to take those first couple of hits and and you know ride them all the way to the end of the line. But you've continued to well. You know, that's funny. You know, I mean, I, I can remember saying, you know, one night, one day, they'll start having punk, punk nostalgia nights, and there will be bands reforming with no original members. And mm -hmm. people say, right, that's ridiculous. No, you know, and it's like, <laughs> but uh, I was never, I was much more, I'm always more interested in what's coming next. I mean, like, I'm sort of like, have to keep my enthusiasm for the album that I've got. But while I'm out thinking, you know, pushing that and everything and playing that, I'd probably be thinking of all this new stuff that I'm going to do. That's you great. Know? That's the best. Best of both worlds. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, my friend, I could talk to you all day, but I know you've got other things to do. So I will thank you for your time today and thank you for this wonderful album. And uh, I hope you make it back to Canada sometime in your travels. Is that where you are? You're in Canada because no I'm, one... I'm right in the middle of Canada in uh, in Winnipeg. You and Amy have been here oh, uh, at I least once Winnipeg. and maybe a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know Winnipeg. Yes. Yes, so uh, played at the the, the Astro, the, the Stew Dome. Stuart. That's right. Yes. yes, and it's like five doors down from Neil Young's house. That's right. Old, oh, yes. Stu's Stu's an old friend. I'll uh, I'll say hi for you. Yes. Well, hopefully I'll see you in Winnipeg. Count on it, sir. All right. Great. Okay. Well, I'll see you later then. Thanks. See you down the road. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.